Hello and welcome everyone. What uh, we have for you here is uh, a little bit of illustration of the kind of work that we've been doing in the social enterprise space. But before that, uh, I'll take a couple of minutes to uh, just introduce what uh, we have here. Uh, the team here with me, Rajesh, Balaji, myself, Vijay, Varun and Jasmine. We are a little team representing Center of Gravity and uh, together we are responsible for the mess that you're going to see on the screen in a while from now. And uh, just to build on the idea over here was to show that how even resource constrained ideas, which is what a bonsai represents, cannot lose the opportunity to make themselves distinctive, make themselves desirable, make themselves preferred. And, and that's what our work is all about. That resources may or may not be under our control, but what we cannot lose out on is the opportunity to be one of a kind. And uh, I'll just briefly share with you our personal journey, how it began in this space. We've been doing work which can be qualified as uh, helping social enterprises in, in their uh, branding or in articulating their own uniqueness. But our journey started actually about eight years ago. And all of us together were working at a firm where we happened to be a part of an exercise which one of the leading petroleum companies in India called Bharat Petroleum, some of you who are not from India will, will probably not know of it, but it's the third largest petroleum company in India, was looking at divestment. Government was divesting its stake out of these companies and their consultants had told them that to get good valuation you need to scale up. And scaling up is, is, a, is a story that uh, we hear from a lot of entrepreneurs. And for them to scale up, the best opportunity was represented by the real estate that they were holding that they had these prime locations and petrol pumps. So they were told that if you expand your pumps into broad-based retailing, which means you do errand malls, departmental stores, and a variety of other things, your valuations will go up and therefore when divestment happens, you'll be able to command a good value. And as a part of that, we were invited by them to give names for the various initiatives that will happen under the petroleum outlet. So if you have a cyber cafe, if you have an ATM, facility, if you have an errand mall, if you have a departmental store, what are the kind of names you need to give in? And that's the uh, kind of understanding of branding which, which they had. And we started our work, we said, let's first understand what is the customer's relationship with your petrol pump. So we said, we'll go and speak to a few people, a few means a few hundred, who buy petrol pump and what do they think about you? And to our surprise, what we found was not so much what they felt about it, but the intensity with which they felt about it. So all of, me, all of them said that there's no difference between uh, Indian oil or a HPCL or a BPCL. All of them said that what we, I mean, we, we can't even trust them with our petrol. And we, the kind of stuff that they sell us is, is just so spurious that I'm scared to put it in my car, but I have no other option. But the, the vitriol with which all this was said, that we had to actually play the tapes in front of the client to show them how intense these feelings are. And, when we asked them to personify the company, we said if this company were to come alive as a person, what would it be like? And this is what people played back. For them, it was a corrupt politician. And at that time, Lalu Prasad Yadav was not that cool. And therefore, that was the epitome of what a petroleum company was for people. And it was all coming from the fact that, number one, you cheat me on my, pri uh, my quality and quantity. Then, on top of it, you have pumps which look absolutely uninviting. And then there is a guy at the front court who is performing a slate of hand. And there's another who's leering at the woman sitting next to me. So it's, it's basically an extremely inhospitable environment in which petrol is sold. So how do you expect me to come and do other transactions in this kind of an environment? And lastly, the kind of messages that the petroleum companies were putting out at that time were all about how we are building the nation, we care for India. So it was classic politician act that the customer was experiencing. So we said that this, it doesn't make any sense for you to sell anything else until and unless you are known for offering value for money in the petroleum space itself. That if customer can't trust you with their petrol, how will they trust you with the grocery? And not only do they need to be given value, but it has to be given so transparently that all the lack of trust that they have right now is addressed in their mind that what we have now is a foolproof way of delivering value to you because otherwise just claiming that we are delivering foolproof value will not cut. So we needed a methodology of delivering transparent value. And therefore, 
this was the beginning of the conception of a program called Pure For Sure. What this program entailed was that pumps were invited to sign up for this program. What they had to do was to put 10 checks and balances in place by which cheating on quality and quantity would become absolutely foolproof. They cannot do it. And in return, the company will give them this seal. So Pure For Sure petrol pump means that you can trust them with your petrol. And then the company backed it with advertising, which I'll just share with you which asked people to look for pure for sure pumps. So it was very dramatic for a government company to stand up and say that out of the, my 5,000 pumps, most of them are cheating you, but please look for this sign before you buy petrol, even from my own pumps. So this program was conceived and we said from Lalu Prasad Yadav, what you need to become and what you can become at your best is a good government officer. Occasionally we do come across government officials who are who are performing their job because they just believe that that's, that's their karma and that's what they need to, to do. And they are not uh, expecting any bribe, whether it's a passport officer or sometimes the ticket collector in a train will give you that extra reservation if he has without asking for anything in return. So we said you have to be like a good passport officer. Don't make a big deal of it. Just do the job that you're supposed to do quietly without attracting any undue attention, without making a big deal. And as a part of that, the Pure for Show program was put in place the pumps were sanitized, the front court staff was given clean t-shirts, they were given training in some basic courtesies. And then it was backed by an advertising campaign which featured real dealers, dealers who had signed up for the program. And I have to share this with you, on the first count, only 80 dealers out of 5,000 agreed to sign up for this. And those were the guys who were showcased. The dealers in Calcutta went on a strike, which means essentially they all acknowledged that they were all cheating. But as this program gathered momentum, in one year, what we saw was that 2,000 pumps signed up for the program. And the pumps that were pure for sure saw a growth rate of nearly 9% when the entire industry had seen a decline of 3% at that point in time. And BPCL went on to win the most respected company award. The pure for sure program was given the, the credit for that. So for us, what this did and so subsequently they did the expansion of their uh, petrol pumps into retail outlets etc and the valuation also went up but what it showed for us as a, as a team which were together on this, pro, uh, on this uh, exercise was that it expanded our view of branding beyond the logos and the taglines and the ad campaigns into something substantial that unless you work on the context of what is under that logo and, and that campaign branding will not cut much ice the other thing was that it expanded our own view of what our work could be at its best. That it is not about fueling consumption, it's not about selling more of clients' products, but it's actually about no, letting a client know this is what your customer is looking for, and if you give it, it will make a great difference to their life, and they will reward you with their commitment and loyalty in return. And, and that is the way we have come to experience the work that we do as a social enterprise for ourselves that unless we have a strategy which actually makes a difference and leaves behind a better society, a better customer experience, a better stakeholder experience, we don't consider that a strategy at all. And we've been very lucky to work with a number of social enterprises, some of them from microfinance, from Indian School Finance Company, Dastakar is in the area of handlooms, BCIL is, is a cause for the rich, it's an eco-friendly uh, enclave developer. Surya Foundation is a, a diabetes foundation, and Red Hat, most of you would be familiar with. We've worked with a lot of not-for-profits, and we continue to draw a lot of strength from the corporations that we work with. These are for-profits. Uh, they may not be directly, very actively doing the kind of social work that some of the other clients do, but they do push us on our craft. They continue to be very demanding. Uh, they continue to work with lesser resource constraints. So we see a lot of work continuing to come from these clients and, and we keep inspiring and encouraging them to look at their work as well in, in those terms. As you saw in, in the BPCL example, for the client, there's a problem which they see as a part, they don't see as a part of a larger issue of the brand. For them, it's like this, the blind man and the elephant story that I have a problem of employee attrition. I have a problem of not knowing who my customer is. I have a problem of not knowing how to package a very complicated idea so that stakeholders will connect with it. So they look at it like that. And our effort is to expand their view of their entire enterprise as one unified entity, which needs to be presented 
as an integrated whole to its stakeholders in, in, in such a creative manner that it, it almost resonates in their minds as, yeah, this is that idea. This is the idea which is just right. I know it will work because it's got that inherent sense of harmony about it, that I've seen it before. That feeling when you get, when you see a great metaphor or a great idea, that's what we try to do with our clients. So what we decided to do today for the session is to share with you brief illustrations of six or seven of engagements that we've been involved in and the kind of challenges that we've tackled. Hopefully some of them will resonate with you as challenges that you've also grappled with at some point in time. And in case you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Of course, we'll have a Q&A at, at the end of it also. But let us first illustrate a few of the examples. Now, this is one from the microfinance space. Uh, there's a small report uh, that has been distributed along with the other uh, collateral, which captures snapshots of this, this work we did. Now, here the question was that we are a microfinance company in the urban space, and we have very little idea of who our customer is. We've been doling out loans at 10,000 rupees to a host of people. We know that broadly they're all living in slums, but we re beyond that we have little understanding of what is their life like? What do they use this money for? What is their income? What is their expenditure? What are their important needs, wants and desires in life? And this was a very extensive study that we did in the urban slums of Bangalore. And what we found was essentially what is called the bottom of the pyramid is itself a pyramid. And there are four kinds of households which explain almost 96% of the population in the slums. At the bottom, and it's like a bit of a snowball story, at the bottom, which is the largest segment, are the migrants. These are people who are first generation urbanites. They've just come from the village or been there for a couple of years in the city. They live in the most decrepit part of the slum, on top of a drain or near the garbage dump. They have little language skills, very low confidence levels. They have no other skills to work with, so they basically use their physical strength to do work like uh, uh, physical labor, like lifting weights from here to there. Their wives, more or less, are completely at a loss in the urban setting. They don't know the language. They don't have the confidence. So they can't even go out and work as a maid. But very often, they also have a little child which needs to be taken care of. So this is the largest part of the urban low-income segment. Above them are people who spent some time in the city. They have figured out one vertical, built some networks. So he's got connections with a painting contractor or a construction contractor, where now he's a part of a team. So there's stability of income, which was not available for the guy at the bottom of the pyramid. With that, they at least go out every day, get a job, but income continues to be low. But their wives have also started working in the neighborhood as maids and started earning a couple of thousand rupees a month. So it's a slightly better economic condition that they are in. 